and and um, get a, a little bit away from moiré systems, but um, still sticking with uh, graphene and, and actually trying to, uh, you know, the overarching message of this talk is that, you know, in the last year or so, we've come to understand that many of the, um, many of the results that have shown up in moiré systems are more generic than that. And they, in fact, don't rely on anything special about uh, super lattice potentials or particular symmetries of twisted bilayer graphene and, and, and things like that. In fact, this is a relatively generic phenomena, and that includes both magnetism and superconductivity. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the implications of that at the end. Okay, so the, you know, the, the thing, the elementary thing I want to start with is just the basic idea that um, density of states is good, right? Uh, high density of states is what you want, and flat band physics is basically coming from the fact that it's at high density of states that uh, interesting physics starts to happen. And that's true for both magnetism and superconductivity as two examples, right? So we know for magnetism from the stoner criterion that there's just a direct competition between bandwidth and, um, and the strength of Coulomb repulsion. And roughly speaking, when you have, uh, when you have a uh, density of states that's sufficiently high, larger than the inverse um, repulsion, then that's when you would expect to have symmetry breaking. Um, but we also have, from a, in a completely different context, uh, BCS superconductivity, where you can look at, let's say, I'm going to write here the, the weak coupling BCS formula applicable for uh, systems in the anti-adiabatic limit, right? And But in any case, it's the same as for, you know, typical BCS, where you have some dimensionless coupling, which depends on density of states. And so for a given temperature, um, you will see superconductivity in a metal, assuming there's not something else going on um, if uh, if your density of states is high enough, right? It has to be higher than some function of the, let's say, dimensionful, let's say, electron-phonon coupling or whatever the coupling is to your glue um, and uh, uh, your um, Fermi temperature and your actual measurement temperature, right? But the basic point is that, you know, everything exotic happens and, and you know, maybe you don't even say these things are exotic, but interesting correlated physics, whether it's all electronic correlations or uh, or has to do with, let's say, phonons happens at high density of states. So, you know, part of the drive in the talk that I gave last time is that, you know, in moiré systems, you realize high density of states, that it's easy to make flat bands of one kind or another. And within those flat bands, you certainly see uh, magnetism. You also see superconductivity. And I didn't discuss too much the connection between those two. I'm going to get to that a little bit more today. But the basic point is, you know, high density of states is good, right? And let's say magic angle systems are one way to make high density of states. Um, but they're not the only way, right? You know, we start in any case from uh, monolayer graphene, and that's very much not in this limit, as I discussed last time. Um, but uh, there's actually a very simple and in some sense ancient way to give yourself a high density of states where all of this can come true. And it doesn't require anything magical. It just requires studying bilayer graphene. So if you look at Bernal bilayer graphene, right, extremely well studied material, um, the density of states actually diverges at the band edge when you apply an electric field. So the, the bit, you know, once you introduce coupling between the atoms that are dimerized, so there's four atoms in the unit cell and the dimerized atoms uh, have, you know, they have strong hopping between them. It's about 10 or 15 percent of the uh, of the intralayer hopping. And um, you can work out that band structure in a very simple model and find that absent a perpendicular electric field, you have um, you have a parabolic band touching. And there's been a lot of work studying, you know, what happens to that parabolic band touching? Is it stable to is it stable to interactions? The answer is no. Uh, this is sort of something that people were into, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, but the situation I want to draw your attention to is that once you put an electric field, you had this parabolic band touching in 2D. When you gap it out, that turns into an effectively quartic band dispersion of a, semi, a semiconductor with a quartic band dispersion. And that quartic band dispersion has a square root Van Hoff singularity at, 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 the, at the band edge. And so that, of course, gives you a very large density of states. Right. And in fact, it was predicted there are a number of theory predictions from, you know, again, dating to 10 or 15 years ago, shortly after bilayer graphene was first became an object of experimental study that at low densities, it should be a ferromagnet and that, you know, there are all kinds of Van Hoop singularity physics that might obtain um, in in this low density limit. OK. And this is just as a note, this is different from 
you know, studying low, uh, low density MOSFETs or three, five semiconductors or, or sort of typical two dimensional electron gas is really driven by Van Hove singularity physics rather than just low density physics, right? It's really high density of states, flat man physics, very much like in Moray systems. Okay, so what about bilayer graphene? So actually, you know, uh, following up a little on some things I told you yesterday, you know, we've certainly done these types of experiments already for years. Um, we can look at the density of states. So what's being plotted here is a capacitance measurement that's giving you access to the inverse compressibility. So high on this scale, and a lot of what I'll show you is, is, is of this type, um, high on this scale means a gap. So you can see that when there's a finite displacement field, you have a very big peak right at charge neutrality. That's the energy gap that opens with an electric field. And then you have these strong dips right next to, um, right next to neutrality. And those apparently are the Van Hove singularities, which basically tells you that apparently nothing interesting happens because in a sense, if you have, uh, if you see a Van Hove singularity, it kind of means that interactions didn't do anything interesting. They didn't destroy the Van Hove singularity. You're sort of, it's apparently wasn't high enough to cause anything exotic to happen. Um, no signatures of ferromagnetism. We've never seen signatures of ferromagnetism in bilayer graphene, you know, uh, despite studying for several years. Um, so, okay, the hypothesis of this talk is this is actually a matter of degree and not of kind. In other words, the idea is sound, right? But the problem is just that for whatever reason, bilayer graphene, you know, repulsion is too low or density of states is too low to actually get you over this sort of threshold to real, you know, to satisfy the stoner criterion or get a finite TC or, or, or drive you into any kind of interesting interacting state at low density. Maybe disorder is too big, but you know, let's say if, if, if we jack up, you know, density of states or um, repulsion, then something interesting eventually should happen. And so the idea to address that is to study rhombohedral trilayer graphene. Um, and uh, this is something that's already been pointed out now for years that, you know, as you go from bilayer to trilayer to four layer, but you keep the structure rhombohedral, then, uh, and that means that rather than the conventional Bernal stacking of ABA, it means you're going ABC. So ABC, ABC, ABC would be rhombohedral graphite, whereas conventional ground state graphite is AB, AB, AB. Um, the, uh, all of these effects should get larger. So you can look at, you know, in, in the simplest model, you can just look at uh, the strength of that divergence. And rather than having uh, P to the fourth, uh, P to the fourth um, dispersion, you would get a P to the sixth dispersion, and therefore a, a stronger divergence. And you know, if you go to four layers, you'll get a P to the eighth, and so on and so forth. And that'll just make that Van Hove singularity stronger and stronger. And therefore, once you account for finite temperature or finite disorder, you'll just get a higher density of states. Of course, you may suffer because it may also lead to larger screening. And so, you know, these are things that one has to consider. We don't know, but um, there were already indications uh, from Andre Gein's group and from Jeannie Lau's group that indeed in ABC trilayer graphene um, at low densities, interesting stuff starts to happen. Some observations of what looked like magnetic hysteresis, maybe. Uh, um, and uh, and so that, that was happening just as we were taking this data. So, so uh, yeah, so let me elaborate on that a little bit, right? So here's in a very simple model, Bernal bilayer. This is, you know, if you, if you, I'll show you this, this model is not really adequate, right? But if you just try to project out the two lowest energy bands, they are more or less localized on the outer layers in both cases, right? And all of the internal atoms, so there's another four atoms in the unit cell in ABC and another two atoms in Bernal, um, they, the wave functions there are at relatively high energy. And so, you know, in a simple, uh, in this simple model, you get kind of an extra, you know, extra divergence there. And then, you know, the more layers you put, the, the higher this power would go basically, right? And there'd be some renormalization of the mass also, which is not drawn there. Um, but okay, so, you know, so that, that's the basic idea. Let's just see if, if a quantitative, um, a quantitative change will give us a qualitative effect. Okay, if we do this a little more carefully, uh, just, you know, again, it'll become relevant later, you can see that it's somewhat more complicated. So, you know, there are a lot of hoppings here. The energies we're dealing with are actually quite small. Uh, that two band approximation is not really quantitatively going to be good. So, you know, you can do this a little more accurately and, and let's just have a look at what the electronic, the predicted electronic structure should look like. And this is what it looks like. So this is, you know, you actually end up having 
sort of saddle point type Van Hove singularities, even at zero displacement field, but there everything is enhanced as you go to larger displacement field. The numbers here are indicate the interlayer potential difference between the top and bottom layer induced by an electric field. And this is basically plotting the band structure and density of states. And here are contours for um, uh, holes and electrons of what that, uh, what that band minimum looks like. And so, you know, you have this relatively strong trigonal warping and then you have a saddle point type Van Hove singularity on the whole side that actually happens at finite energy away from the band edge, whereas on the electron side, it's pretty much pinned to the band edge, not precisely, but but, but very close. So, um, so the bottom line is, you know, this is a system where you have these rather large divergences, including one at rather finite density uh, for holes, and, um, and you can now try to play with what happens to the system as you dope it, because you have, of course, electrostatic control over this, if you can make it. Okay, um, right. So these are kind of some of the uh, some of the Fermi contours, um, especially for holes. I want to focus on because that's where a lot of the interesting physics is going to occur. Um, you know, the basic as you dope the system, you start off with three uh, three Fermi pockets. Those Fermi pockets merge at a saddle point where you get this divergent density of states. Then you have an annular Fermi C, and then as you keep doping it. Uh, uh, further and further away from neutrality, eventually that annulus uh, disappears and you just have a regular, uh, uh, you know, simply connected Fermi C and a single Fermi, a single Fermi contour. Okay, okay so the, the challenge then is, is to make it, right? And, and I, I will give credit where it's due to, to my excellent now graduating graduate student, Hao Shen Zhou and um, Ben Shea, a good undergrad who, uh, who helped him in all of this. The, the main challenge here is that ABC is not the ground state of graphite. ABA is the ground state of graphite. And as a result, you have to stabilize this metastable, um, this metastable structure. Now, um, that is both better and worse than it sounds. So the, the problem is that it's very easy to relax to ABA, uh, ABA graphene, uh, especially while you're doing the type of manipulations that we typically do, where we pick up a layer and we want to sandwich it between a number of other layers. That introduces some strain. Things can move around. And if you have some ABA and some ABC coexisting, then the ABA will rapidly expand. There's, you can think about it. There's always pressure on that domain wall between ABA and ABC. And as soon as you heat it a little bit, you know, and it's, it's pinned by something. And then as soon as you allow that to depin, then it will the ABA regions will totally expand. Now that is a blessing and a is a curse and a blessing. And the, the blessing is that failures tend to be complete. So in other words, if you start off with a mixture of ABA and ABC, by the time you're done with your processing, you're unlikely to have any ABC left at all. It will completely relax to ABA. And conversely, if you succeed, you will have pure single domain ABC in, and more likely than not, without any issues of, let's say, the equivalent of Moray disorder. That's just a, that's just uh, it's unusual. That doesn't happen. You know, sometimes maybe you end up with two domains, but you never end up with some micro domain structure because it's just not stable. It'll turn into ABA. So it's possible to make a system that is essentially perfect and free of disorder. Um, there are a bunch of tricks to making this actually happen with, uh, uh, you know, a sample yield that's consistent with human sanity um, and so one of those is, you know, basically figuring out how to cut. You can use anodic oxidation lithography to cut out these ABC domains so that they're isolated from any ABA domains, and that helps. Um, and then the main thing is to keep checking whether you've relaxed to ABA by doing Raman spectroscopy, which can distinguish these two stacking orders um, as you fabricate uh, the devices and, you know, try to minimize how much you're squeezing them and twisting them and bending them and so on. So again, it fails completely or not at all, but it is possible to make uh, these pristine ABC structures. And what I'm going to show you is all from structures that are made using kind of the same best practices uh, of hygiene um, that I described in the last talk, meaning we use graphite gates which means that the charge disorder is extremely low. And now we have a system where there's no equivalent of moiré disorder because there's no moiré, it's just graphene. Uh, and so we expect it to be as clean and uniform as uh, Bernal bilayers or monolayers, which of course we've studied uh, very extensively, right? Uh, and so, yeah, so that that's uh, this this I showed you last time. Okay, so, um, so this is what data looks like. Let's start with this. Okay, so what I'm plotting here 
is a capacitance measurement. So we can measure the capacitance between top and bottom gates, which gives us access to the inverse compressibility, uh, d mu dn. Okay? And so what's plotted here is d mu dn um, as a function of charge carrier density and uh, electronic displacement field. Okay, and so the claim I'm going to make is that almost everything you're looking at is actually a magnetic transition, uh, that all of these bright features are phase transitions between states with different spin or and or valley polarization. Okay, and that there's a whole, you know, that, that let me start with that. Okay, um, so there's one exception, which is that you can see this feature here. Uh, where there's actually a step in the density of states, and this is what a line cut along zero displacement field looks like. That step in the density of states, we can reliably, and I'll show you again later exactly how to do this, um, we can reliably identify with uh, the transition between four simple Fermi surfaces and four annuli. And so that step is coming from the nucleation of this electron-like Fermi surface inside the whole, uh, inside the whole, uh, the, the, the whole Fermi C. Um, and uh, that matches very well single particle calculations, and it's right where you expect it. And and, and I'll show you quantum oscillations uh, do that, right? So the way you can the way you can look at this most clearly, I think, is and, and in a way that's most familiar maybe to to people is to uh, look at quantum oscillations. So these samples are extremely clean, okay? And you can see that from the fact that you get very high resolution quantum oscillations. So what we're looking at here is quantum oscillations, and I want you to notice. The magnetic field scale just goes from zero to one Tesla. Okay, so that's a very small field, but all of these features are these are quantum oscillations. And so we can um, you know, use those in the way that you know has been done for a hundred years to try to probe the uh, Fermi surface areas, right? And so we're gonna take this, we're gonna plot it, we're gonna write it as one over as a function of one over b and then take the Fourier transform. And then the, the data I'm gonna show you throughout this talk shows that Fourier transform normalized by the total number of electrons, okay? So what that means is that when I show you the Fourier transforms, the, the, the peaks are gonna indicate what proportion of the total Fermi surface area, the total Fermi C area uh, corresponds to that peak. So for example, if I show you a Fourier transform that has a peak at one quarter, then that means that there are four Fermi surfaces presume you know, that, and that means there's a peak at a quarter of the total area. And if that's all I see, it's reasonable to conclude that that means there are four identical Fermi surfaces, each of which encloses a quarter of the total density, the total area in K-space, okay? Um, so, uh, so here we go. So here's, a, uh, here's the Fourier transform of this data. This is now taken at zero displacement field, okay? And we can see basically the features that I told you before. So this is where that step was in density of states. And now we can look at quantum oscillations and you can see that to the left of that step at higher densities, you just have a peak at one quarter. Uh, in other words, you have four Fermi surfaces with equal area. But then once you get below that absolute density, you see the nucleation of a new Fermi surface at low density and the area of these larger Fermi surfaces starts to grow. And that's exactly, uh, you know, what you'd expect with these annuli, right? You start to nucleate a new Fermi surface, the outer one has to grow so that the difference between those frequencies actually comes out to a quarter because you still have fourfold spin and valley symmetry. And you can see the same thing uh, on the electron side, although there the, the band structure is a bit different. So these, these an this annular region is much less well-developed, although you can see a little indication of it. Um, at very low densities, you can see that uh, you actually have a strong peak at one twelfth of the total area, which, and that's exactly what you'd expect given the fermiology I sort of described at the beginning, where at very low densities, you have strong trigonal warp and you actually have three pockets in each spin and valley flavor. So that's 12 total pockets. And you see a very strong peak at a twelfth of the total area, which means that you have 12 you know, identical to within experimental resolution, 12 identical pockets, okay? But in between, things look more interesting, okay? In particular, if you look over on the electron side, you can see that there's, uh, there's a narrow region of density where you have a strong peak at a half, but not at any other, not at a quarter, right? If you have a quarter and you have a half, that's simple to understand, that's harmonics, right? And that's typical in quantum oscillation measurements. But if you have 
a peak at a half but not a quarter, that's basically telling you that actually there you only have two Fermi surfaces, right? And that's what you'd expect if you have, let's say, symmetry breaking. And now instead of occupying four Fermi surfaces, you now occupy two much bigger Fermi surfaces, uh, let's say, of a reduced number of spin and valley uh, flavors. Okay, and this is sort of borne out, you know, this, this, this so, so the, the, the idea of, um, you know, you can see that there may be some indications of symmetry breaking already at zero displacement field, but at high displacement field, actually, this becomes much stronger. And in particular, even if you just look at compressibility data, you can see that there are strong negative compressibility features. These light, bright cyan colored features are actually um, negative electronic compressibility. That's, of course, beyond any single particle effect, right? Um, and it's typically associated with non-uniform states in 2D, right? So that, you know, famous examples of where you see negative compressibility are Wigner crystals, but also first order phase transitions. And, and, and this is of the latter type and for the most of the ones you see, we think are first order phase transitions. Okay, so the simplest thing to do is then go out at large displacement field and have a look at those quantum oscillations uh, within these different regions, right? So we can go along the top of this curve, uh, the top, top of this color plot, and just look at that same type of Fourier transform of the quantum oscillations in resistivity out in this region at high density. And there you see that you have a peak at a quarter, so fourfold degenerate Fermi surface. Each Fermi surface is a quarter of the total density. Within this region, which I call 2x, for reasons that are going to be clear in about three seconds, you know, you see something at one half. So that's, again, that means that there are now two Fermi surfaces, right, each of which encloses half the total area. And then down at low density, there's this broad region where you see a peak only at one. And that basically means that you have a single Fermi surface, and that contour encloses all of the, uh, all of the density, Right? So basically what this tells you is that these negative compressibility features are associated with transitions where the degeneracy of the, uh, of the Fermi C changes right, from four to two to one. Okay? Exactly what you'd expect if you have a uh, ferromagnetic uh, transition. So in other words, you know, you are, um, as you lower the density, you just lose some degeneracies. That's what your electron system wants to do, right? And you can understand this reasonably quantitatively from a, you know, from a pretty simple stoner model, right? Uh, so you start off by just accounting for, you know, the kinetic energy, the chemical potential of each flavor, and then, you know, we put in some phenomenological repulsion, which just favors uh, polarizing into uh, uh, into some number of flavors. So it prefers, it, you know, this is just our model of exchange in, in the sort of same way as, as the stoner model usually does. Okay, and we do this for this, you know, as realistic as we can uh, band structure, right, for both, you know, zero displacement field, it looks like this, at high displacement field, it looks like this. And we just try to see what that comes up with. And it comes up with something kind of reasonable, right? So this is a comparison between experiment on top and, and theory on the bottom. Okay, and so the basic thing you can see is that the, the shape of the, so black in the theory is where there's no uniform state uh, that, that exists there. And that basically is telling you that's where there's a first order phase transition with, with phase separation, where you'd expect to have negative compressibility. Otherwise, the compressibility is calculated in the theory. And so you can see that it, they, they, the negative compress, the phase transition lines in this density displacement field uh, plane follow the right qualitative behavior. And that's just basically coming from stoner physics of the fact that they are sensitive to density of states. And this is really just tracking the evolution of density of states as a function of density uh, in this material coming from band structure, right? That All that goes in here is band structure. There's nothing subtle. So, um, so apparently that makes sense. There is one wrong thing. I'm, I'm starting off by talking about um, electron doping, by the way, because it, the band structure there is much simpler. So, um, there is one wrong thing already, though, even in this very simple band edge Van Hove singularity regime, which is that the stoner model as written um, predicts the wrong number of transitions. In other words, it, it would like to find a one fold, two fold, and then also a three fold uh, regime, right, which is not observed in experiment. Um, turns out you can fix this phenomenologically in the stoner model in a way that's sort of reasonable, which is to say, look, you know, the real symmetries of the system are spin symmetry and valley symmetry. There's not actually an SU4 symmetry between those things, but, um, but the stoner model kind of does have a 
an artificial SU4 symmetry. If you break that with a kind of Huns coupling, then you can fix this and you can make, uh, you know, you can make your stoner model look more like the experiment. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of logical. The, the numbers you need to get, you need to put in for this Huns coupling are kind of reasonable given the scale, uh, you know, sort of lattice scale differences between, um, uh, between the valley wave functions. But, um, but with the stoner model, so, so, you know, so we have this sort of idea that, okay, this is indeed exchange physics. It makes sense uh, for it to be uh, basically coming from the idea that as you go to lower and lower density, you're trying to ride up this density of states. And at some point it becomes favorable because you're in this flat, getting close to this flat band limit to uh, just polarize your electrons. And the way you do that is by first polarizing into two out of four flavors and then into one out of four flavors. Um, the stoner model doesn't tell you which flavors, right? You have two spin, you know, two spin projections and two valleys, and there are lots of different uh, types of ways you could polarize within that, uh, within that space. So you need to do some experiment to figure that out, but we can do that. So for example, we can look at the parallel field dependence of these transitions, right? And you can see that between the one-fold and two-fold phases marked here, there's no dependence on the in-plane field. Now, the in-plane field in such a thin two-dimensional material, it's reasonable to assume it couples to the spin. And, you know, we have evidence that that's in fact true. Um, and so the conclusion you would draw is that the one-fold and two-fold states have the same spin polarization. They're either both unpolarized or both polarized, or they're certainly polarized the same way. Whereas between the two-fold and four-fold, uh, the two-fold state is strongly favored. And in fact, there's a cusp at zero magnetic field. That's what you'd expect if the two-fold state had spontaneous spin polarization at zero magnetic field. This is basically uh, telling you there's a divergent susceptibility or some finite polarization already. Whereas the four-fold state, which is symmetric, of course, has to have zero, uh, zero spin polarization. So, um, so we can conclude from that that the one-fold state is spin and valley polarized. The two-fold state is valley unpolarized, but spin polarized. And then, of course, the symmetric state is, is unpolarized. Okay. And there's a sort of a, a note for the experts. It's going to be important uh, later in the talk. Um, but uh, is that this was a bit surprising because typically in graphene, these Huns couplings are, are usually antiferromagnetic. It tends, you know, in general, people think that, you know, in quantum hall and in other situations where the physics should all be kind of the same, you typically assume that it's going to be um, uh, those, those short range interactions favor valley K spin up valley K prime spin down type polarizations. So valley antiferromagnets, but here it seems to be a valley ferromagnet. In other words, there's, it's valley unpolarized, but it is indeed spin polarized. Um, uh, so ferromagnetic Huns coupling, which is a, a bit, you know, is a bit different than, than what's usually happens in, um, in graphene. Um, you can check this by the way. So you can, you, of course you can do lots of measurements, right? So you can check that valley polarization assumption that I made. Um, by looking at anomalous hall, and you can see that in the valley polarized uh, state, so the one fold valley polarized state, you see a strong anomalous hall effect, right? And that's what you'd expect because each valley has Berry curvature that gives you an anomalous hall effect, but those Berry curvatures have to cancel between the two uh, between the two valleys. And so only if you valley polarize would you expect to see uh, anomalous hall, but you do in this one fold state, you don't in the two fold state. So that's kind of two checks on what this two fold state is. It tells you that it is indeed valley unpolarized because there's no anomalous hall, but it's uh, apparently spin polarized because it's favored linearly in energy at low magnetic fields over this symmetric state. So we kind of pretty confident that we know what these three, um, what these three states are on the electron side out at high density. So, so that's sort of how we can work this stuff out. Okay, so now let's move over to the whole side, which is much more complicated. Okay, so um, the phenomenology is that there are lots more transitions, right? And some of these transitions are sharp and some of them are not sharp. If you look at quantum oscillations, here you can just plot quantum oscillations of the capacitance and you can see that there are some regions like, uh, oops, like this one and this one and this one, which are pretty simple. They look very similar to the electron side. You have one fold, two fold and four fold. So, you know, we would call that one fold state a quarter metal. It's very simple. It has one Fermi surface of one flavor and the two fold state we would call a half metal. It has exactly two Fermi surfaces of two flavors, but then the others are totally empty. But, um, but here there seem to be many other regimes in between where there, you know, at, this is measured at one, one Tesla. There are dense Landau level crossings. It's very hard to figure out what exactly is going on. Okay. 
so so there's already certainly more complication happening on the whole side um there's also you know this is sort of a uh, not entirely clear what um uh wh why this is at all but uh there are um stronger hysteresis effects on this side so for example you know within the v spin and valley polarized quarter metal um the anomalous hall effect can you know you can certainly tune it around change its sign but then it can also become strongly hysteretic one thing i'll note for those of you who were paying attention in my last talk is that what we never see so far in these in in abc are multiple barkhausen like jumps the magnetization seems to always reverse in one jump right and that's sort of what you'd expect if, if it's really a uniform system and there's no pinning sites of the type that I showed you due to twist angle disorder, maybe not too surprising. But in fact, you know, you, these magnets can be in fact hysteretic as a function of the out of plane field. You're clearly switching an orbital moment associated with the valley polarization. Um, actually, you know, the- uh, Before you go on, there's a question from Priya Sharma who asks, are these observations experimentally reproducible across many samples, for example? Not yet, but, uh, well, so I'll tell you what's reproducible. This phase diagram is very reproducible. We've measured this in capacitance several times. Um, we've only measured transport very carefully on one sample. And you know, certainly we can do it over and over again. Uh, the, 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 the positions of these phase boundaries are the same across several samples. We've only done these careful transport measurements so far on one sample. And we're working on now you know, cranking these out and, and getting some statistics. But my guess and is that it's going to be very reproducible because I think that the details of where these transitions are in this general phase diagram certainly seem to be quantitatively identical between different samples. And then, you know, the transport phenomenology, we just haven't looked, but given that the capacitance phenomenology is all the same, I expect the transport phenomenology to also be quite similar, but we haven't done it yet. So I shouldn't say anything until, until we just check. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but it's a great question. And I think, I, you know, I will come back to this at the very end, but I think that's actually what's most exciting to me about this system is precisely that I, I have zero concerns about reproducibility as long as you can make the samples, because I think there's not that that variable of moray disorder, which is going to be different between every sample and may or may not affect this or that physics. There's just there's just fewer ingredients here that can be spatially non-uniform, which is kind of the bane of, of our existence in moray physics. So, um, so yeah, let me show one last thing, which is kind of, uh, kind of cool because we've never seen this, uh, in another system, despite, you know, let's say quantum hall systems or so on, where we have in principle, first order phase transitions here, you have some first order phase transitions in this case, between, a uh, a spin and valley polarized state and some spin and valley unpolarized state where you have 12 Fermi pockets, but actually you can also see hysteresis as you cross this phase transition line, just as a function of density at zero magnetic field. So it seems like you know the metastability of these is pretty uh, uh, is, is pretty strong, and you know everything things do not have pathways to relax. They sort of all go uh, they jump at once uh, or or not at all. Okay, um, so so then the question is, what are these transitions? How can we understand these other transitions? Um, and one obvious candidate, right, and, and is that uh, the band structure on the whole side is more complicated. Right. Rather than just having a single band edge Van Hoop singularity, you have uh, you you have a finite density, divergent density of states, and then you have also a step Van Hoop singularity where this annulus disappears. And so there's certainly possibility for Lipschitz transitions. And because of the shape of this density of states that goes up and down, it's also possible to have you know partially polarized phases more akin to a conventional ferromagnet where you have majority and minority uh, flavors. And so, in fact, we find both, right? And the way we find them is, again, by going back to uh, quantum oscillations as a sort of high precision probe of the Fermi surface. And you can see here that at high, uh, at you start at high density, as I showed you before, just like at zero displacement field, you have four Fermi surfaces. And then as you lower the density, you know, and the same thing is true um, in the twofold case and the twofold uh, state you have um, just two Fermi surfaces that are simple, but then in between you transition to annuli and then there's this extra transition where it's something below, there's some small Fermi surfaces, it's unclear, the Fermiology here is just not that easy to interpret, 
but there's clearly some small Fermi surfaces. There are also some large ones which are approximately two-fold degenerate, but they're less than the total. They're less than the total density, which means that presumably we have something like two majority and two minority Fermi surfaces there. But the Fermiology there is 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 complicated. The quantum oscillations are are they're well developed, but there's lots of stuff going on. So it generate you know there's and and that stuff doesn't stay consistent for large enough ranges of field to actually get good Fourier transforms that don't have multiple peaks. But there's clearly some regime which we'll call a partially isospin polarized regime where there's there's majority and minority Fermi surfaces. Okay, and then the same thing basically repeats as you go down to lower density. So now along this contour, you start within this twofold simple, you know, simple half metal, right? And then you have annuli, and then at some point you're gonna have a quarter metal, which is very simple again, and again, annular quarter metal, but in between you have some partially isospin polarized phase where maybe you have some low uh, some low density Fermi surfaces and you have some higher density Fermi surfaces and we don't exactly understand what that is. And then at very low density, you again have a peak around a 12th, which is you know, consistent with having these, um, uh, these trigonally warped pockets. Okay, so we can sort of make a tentative phase diagram here of the whole side where at very low density and displacement field, you have 12 pockets, but then you have this cascade of transitions. And you know, the, the thing that I basically want you to take away, I know this is kind of complicated, it's difficult to absorb on the fly, but here's, you know, here's the main message, right? Is that there's a pattern that happens and it happens at least twice where you go from having simple Fermi surfaces of a given degeneracy, then you have annular Fermi surfaces, and then somewhere those annuli transition to some partially, they depolarize or they polarize, but partially, right? And then there's some partially isospin polarized phase, which is occurring um, and eventually polarizes completely. Okay, that's, that's the physics that, that matters is that, you know, simple Fermi surface, simple Van Hove, you know, where you just nucleate a new pocket, that's not that interesting, that's just band structure, but then those annuli become a partially isospin polarized phase. And the same thing happens again with half the degeneracy later on, right? Where you have annuli and then you have some maybe majority minority one plus one type uh, partially isospin polarized phase, okay? The reason that I'm harping on what seems like a kind of annoying detail, right? Is that as I'll show you, superconductivity happens right along these yellow lines, which are the hardest place for us to understand what's going on, okay? Um, Okay, before I talk about that, though, let me talk about just briefly bilayer graphene, right? What happened to bilayer graphene? We studied this for years. Why did we never see this physics? The, the band structure is basically the same. And the answer is because we weren't looking for it. It actually turns out it's there, right? So uh, the stoner physics is totally generic. We've gone back and looked at bilayer graphene with, you know, our newfound knowledge. And we see very similar physics, very similar transitions, one fold, two fold phases on both electron and hole side. It all happens at much lower density and much larger displacement fields, which is a regime we just were not looking at previously. But um, yeah, it turns out that, you know, this Van Hoff singularity physics is generic. There, there are detailed differences in particular. There's no, you know, a, a new hopping that shows up in uh, this gamma two hopping, which is between some secondary atoms on the outer layers, turns out to be important for making that Van Hove singularity go to finite density, which is a, drives a lot of the whole side physics. But the basic physics of stoner ferromagnetism is in fact there in bilayer graphene, and we just we just it wasn't on our radar. So um, so this is samples you know made you know whatever five years ago, and yeah, we just pulled them out of a drawer, and they're um, they show the same type of physics, okay? So the last thing let me talk about before I, I switch to superconductivity um, is- Can I uh, ask a question about that? Yes, please, please, yeah. Um, so there's another axis, which is temperature. Does that play a role in any of this? And does changing temperature make it easier or more difficult to see some of these things or make any other phase transition? Yeah, so it, we, we just haven't explored it all that strongly. You know, the, the, certainly the, the feature, you can see features associated with these magnets at say five or six Kelvin still in tri-layer. We haven't actually pushed much higher than that. Um, the, uh, we, we just haven't explored that carefully. I think there's interesting physics there in particular to try to see whether that can give you a handle on you know, neutral modes and whether, you know, the entropy of those neutral modes can have an effect on these transitions. But we, we just haven't done that work yet, but it's a good question. Um, 
I'll show you a little bit more temperature dependence when we talk about superconductivity, obviously. But uh, but yeah, so far we've just sort of focused on you know cool it down as much as possible and see what happens, and you know we'll we'll move on as as we as we sort that out. Okay, thank so, you. So so um, okay, so I want to just just make one nod to Moiré physics, which is um, to point out that you know okay, so what we have in ABC is apparently a system that has a Van Hove singularity and it gives us symmetry breaking and you know that's obviously going to be itinerant in nature um it's just this is just the physics of metals really right tuning the density of states um and you know in a in a crystalline system you can get gaps at commensurate fillings of the lattice um and so in this system that's only charge neutrality right there's no other commensurate filling that's easily accessible by um uh by electrostatic doping so the solution, if you want to study gap states, then is to is to turn on a moiré, and this is in fact what was done um, already a couple of years ago by Feng Wang's group and collaborators, um, where they made a moiré on ABC. The idea being to generate a flat band from the moiré. So we can actually revisit some of that intuition in light of this, right? And and in particular, I just want to quickly show um, a comparison between ABC trilayer compressibility and ABC trilayer with a moiré compressibility measured in otherwise identical device geometries, right? And the basic message I want you to take is that these look rather similar, right? All of the ferromagnetic physics is mostly the same, but what happens is that at commensurate filling of the moiré, there are these bright yellow lines, right? At, at four or two or one, right? And those are gap states. They're happening when you're now at one, two or four filling of the moiré potential. But it turns out there's actually a very simple way to understand those, which is that in the absence of a moiré, we know we have half and quarter metals, right? So that means, you know, in, typically in graphene without interactions, if you have, uh, ha you know, if you have a, a, a fourfold degeneracy and you have a moiré, you expect to have a gap or maybe a Dirac point at four electrons or holes per unit cell because that corresponds to single particle filling one moiré miniband. Okay, but if you have a half metal to begin with, you only have a degeneracy of two. So turning on a weak moiré potential, basically you expect to have a single particle gap once you've accounted for the fact that the symmetry is already broken, you expect to have that gap at two electrons or holes per unit cell. And that's what you see basically when, you know, when your half metal state that, uh, or two X state as I've been calling them in these slides, um, overlaps in density with where two electrons or two holes fill the moiré, you will get a gap state because now you're just gapping out that half metal. And same thing for a quarter metal at nu equals minus one, right? And so that's indeed what you see, right? And um, anyway, I'm not going to talk more about moiré physics. I think that the, the message here is that actually the correlation physics in ABC certainly is just pre-existing. Everything that you see in a moiré system is there already as far as the tendency towards ferromagnetism. The difference is that now you can have gaps at commensurate filling that's not charge neutrality. And so therefore you can put a gap right in the middle of your Van Hove singularity. And that turns out to be interesting, including some of those are churn insulators and, 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 and so on. But um, uh, you can get gaps now at fractional filling. This is in our paper if you're interested. But the bottom line is actually that the moiré is a weak perturbation on the interactions. That it's certainly for this system, the energy scale is, you know, the energy scales are U is big, right? Compared to density of states and the moiré potential itself, call it V moiré, is small compared to U. All it's doing is sort of opening up some gaps, but it's not actually the thing that's <coughs> really responsible for, um, for setting up the problem, if you want. Okay, so what about transport, right? So I've shown you mostly compressibility. I've been a little cagey, right? So what about, what about transport? I mentioned superconductivity, right? So I'm gonna flash back and forth between compressibility here, right, where you see all these phase transitions and transport measurements taken at low temperature, okay? And basically what you can see is that in transport, you can also see many of these same boundaries have a good contrast in, in transport. The resistivity just changes across these transitions, but also you can identify that near some of these transitions, there are these very low resistance states, okay? So in particular, what we're going to call superconductor one, superconductor two, and superconductor three, right, are all uh, appear near these transitions. Okay, and how do we know they're superconductors, right? Well, you know, two things. One is that the resistivity is is vanishing or getting or getting much smaller 
at some temperature. The other is that there's an onset of nonlinearity, which is then going to be destroyed by a magnetic field. So in particular, here you can see that the, the most robust one is superconductor one. What I'm plotting here is nonlinear, uh, not DVDI as a function of current. And you can see that below about 120 millikelvin, you uh, see this sudden onset of zero resistance and uh, um, uh, strong nonlinearity is exactly characteristic of a superconductor. For the other two superconductors, especially SC2, you don't quite get to zero resistance, but TC looks very low. It's like 40 millikelvin, maybe 30 millikelvin. Um, the onset temperature of this stuff is certainly not lower than 40 millikelvin, not higher than 40 millikelvin. Same thing for SC3. They're weaker, but they show very, very similar, um, very similar behavior. Okay, so um, so let's look at SC1, right? It's, it seems like TC is about 100 millikelvin. Here's what it looks like as a function of density. Okay, you see at low temperatures, you uh, just have a region where you have zero resistance. Um, that's uh, destroyed by temperature. You can do BKT fits to try and extract uh, a transition temperature you find is about 100 millikelvin. And, and uh, you know, this is what R versus T looks like. It just uh, suddenly starts to drop off below some temperature, right? Okay, sorry, that's out of date. The preprint, of course, is, on, is available. Okay, so, um, so what I want to present is just the state of our knowledge on these, uh, you know, on these, um, on these superconductors and what's happening. But maybe the first thing you can ask is, what's the fermiology, you know, where the superconductivity actually occurs. So it's happening, right, right along a boundary, which previously identified with these partially isospin polarized transitions. So you're going from annuli to some partially isospin polarized phase. That's where SC1 occurs. Okay, and we can look at this detailed fermiology, right? We can look at quantum oscillations right near where the superconductor is, is happening. So here's the superconductor. You can see that it's to the left of the transition. In other words, the superconductivity is occurring where the Fermi surface is an annulus, or rather, it's in this case, it's four annuli. Okay, and then it stops right when you get to the transition into some partially isospin polarized phase. Okay, so that is a fact. <laughs> um, and uh, so anyway, so that let's start with SC1 and just keep that in mind that this is a superconductivity coming from a normal state that is four annular Fermi surfaces that are, you know, just uh, spin and valley uh, symmetric. Okay. Um, so a natural question, right, I think that makes sense is can this be unconventional, right? And uh, or is it conventional? I don't know. Um, I'm not going to answer that question, uh, but I'm going to at least point out, right, that, you know, in some sense, the zeroth order question you can ask about any new superconductor is, is it in the clean limit? Because after all, you know, conventional superconductivity, and it's a great thing that this is true, is protected from normal types of disorder by Anderson's theorem, whereas unconventional superconductivity often is not. Um, and so you can look at the abrikasov gorkov type parameter where you compare the coherence length with the uh, mean free path and ask, you know, are we in the clean limit or are we in the uh, are we in the dirty limit? If you're in the dirty limit, you can say, okay, for sure there should be Anderson's theorem, and so I better not think uh, about anything too exotic, right? So how do we measure this? We can measure the Ginzburg-Landau um, uh, coherence length by just looking at the critical magnetic field. A critical out of plane magnetic field. And then we can look at mobility for mean free path, for example. So let's do the critical magnetic field. You can see the critical magnetic field. This is as a function of density. And here's plotted nonlinear resistivity as a function of uh, the same magnetic field for some you know, kind of random choice of doping. You can actually see in the nonlinear resistivity these little wiggles. Those are sort of on a one millitesla scale. That indicates maybe some interference around loops of size, you know, square micron or more. Um, but uh, taking that critical field and just putting it into, you know, formula from Tinkum, you get a coherence length of a couple hundred nanometers. Of course, it varies with density, but it's, you know, as large as, uh, uh, you know, microns, but, um, uh, but can be maybe a, a, a couple hundred nanometers. Okay, so um, trying to measure mean free path, you know, we can look at our normal state resistivity is extremely low, it's 20 ohms. Right, so that sort of suggests a mean free path of about a micron. But actually, we can do a little better than that. We can actually find a qualitative measurement, uh, which is uh, going to tell us something kind of spectacular, which is that you know our device looks something like this. It's kind of got this shape. This spacing between contacts is a couple of microns. 
It turns out that in these, uh, you know, if you measure these types of devices, it's typical in graphene that you have ballistic electrons. And one of the signatures of ballistic electrons is actually that if you pass a, um, if you try to pass a current from, uh, from two contacts on one side, there's no way for the current to go to ground except for by scattering ballistically, right, off of the, well, scattering off of the boundaries. It's going to, these electrons will propagate ballistically. And you'll see resonances, geometric resonances in the magnetic field corresponding to when, uh, when these um, orbits are uh, just lining up with your other contacts. So you can detect a non-local voltage uh, in this geometry at a given field, which tells you about ballistic trajectories of electrons. And what that means is that uh, basically your mean free path must be lo as long as this semicircle for you to see this effect. And we see this effect rather clearly. Um, so that suggests actually that the mean free path is probably more like on the order of five or 10 microns, which is about the size of our device. So similar to other graphene samples, you know, at least the big Fermi surface of these annuli seems to be pretty much ballistic. Um, so not much, not much disorder uh, strongly as a result in the clean limit, right? This, this parameter of D over, uh, of uh, Xi over L is, you know, and then below 0.1 at most 0.2. So we can't, we can't rule out exotic superconductivity purely on account of disorder. Okay, now we can do things like check the Pauli limit, right? So uh, let's look at um, uh, SC1. I'll focus on SC1, continue to focus on SC1, right? The basic idea is that if you have a spin singlet pairing, this pairing will be destroyed when your Zeeman energy is comparable to that superconducting gap. And within BCS, that superconducting gap is sort of a simple function of the transition temperature. Um, if you uh, just try to do those estimates, right, and fit these formulas, you find uh, you find that in fact it seems pretty much reasonable to have it uh, be matched by the Pauli limit. So within you know vanilla BCS, uh, there's a fixed ratio between the out of plane critical field, uh, sorry, the in plane critical field at zero uh, temperature and the transition temperature at zero magnetic field of 1.7. We find that the it fits very well to the right formula, but maybe that ratio is 1.23. But I'm going to say that this is pretty consistent with being spin singlet. We're not able to go to temperatures much lower than the uh, critical temperature anyway, because the critical temperatures are so low. But certainly, I wouldn't I wouldn't go around claiming this is anything except for a poly limited, uh, uh, presumably spin singlet superconductor. Okay. So, questions about this, and then I'll move on to the next superconductor. Okay. Um, so let's talk about SC2. So this is a weaker superconductor. Um, we don't get all the way to zero temperature, uh, all the way to zero resistivity. Um, you get to about, you know, 15, I don't know, 10 or 20 ohms uh, from a normal state resistance of, of, uh, of 100. But you do see the evolution of these, uh, you know, nonlinear uh, resistivity peaks uh, right at the, at the critical current, very similar to other clean 2D superconductors. Um, the fermiology is more complicated to deal with because uh, now you're in a regime where you have competition between valley polarized and valley unpolarized states. That actually means that the boundaries between these regions shift without a plane magnetic field. It's just a technical issue that complicates um, complicates our ability to uh, to analyze these carefully. But the bottom line is that here's SC2, and again we think that you know the the evolution here is from a, a annular Fermi surface which is presumably where SC2 is occurring, but it's an annular Fermi surface with only two flavors um, to, uh, uh, to some kind of partially isospin polarized phase. And that this SC2 is occurring right on the boundary of a partially isospin polarized phase, just like SC1. The big difference though, is that it's normal state has a missing degeneracy. And actually we think that missing degeneracy is spin. We think that it's actually superconductivity from a fully spin polarized uh, Fermi surface, right? Valley unpolarized, spin polarized. And this seems to be uh, confirmed by the total uh, absence of any sensitivity, as far as we can tell, to an in-plane magnetic field. So in-plane magnetic field, um, here's plotted nonlinear DVDI again as a function of current. Um, for zero parallel field, but then also for one Tesla of parallel field. And, you know, this is a tiny, 
Uh, this is a very weak superconductor, but one Tesla of in-plane field, apparently it's happy with that. One millitesla of out-of-plane field will destroy it completely. Okay, so on the left, you're seeing the dependence on B perpendicular, right? And at one millitesla of perpendicular field, it's gone. But at one Tesla of in-plane field, it's, uh, it's fine, right? So, um, so this, I think, makes sense for... Uh, a totally spin polarized superconductor. It's just totally insensitive to the in-plane field. Every time we've found some sensitivity, it's turned out it's just because it's very hard to align to a part in a thousand uh, your magnetic field uh, in the plane, and any small magnetic field out of that out of the plane will uh, will will destroy that. Okay, so um, so that that may not be so shocking, right? Because um, if you consider an, a half metal uh, in a conventional system, you know you need to do something exotic. But in graphene, you have the valley degree of freedom. Right, and so um, you can uh, basically uh, you can basically construct an, an order parameter rather naturally by you know conventional pairing type mechanisms um, where you're simply pairing states in opposite valleys, right? But with the same spin because the valley symmetry uh, is effectively um, spinless time reversal, right? And so you can you can use that to make a kind of spinless Kramer's pair, if you want to call it that, um, and then you would end up with a uh, superconductor where as long as you don't scatter between valleys, you have a version of Anderson's theorem anyway, and you don't need to have an unconventional pairing mechanism to, um, to give it, uh, to, to, to make it happen. Uh, just an idea, but uh, just the point is that, you know, what we know from our fermiology is that this is spin polarized valley unpolarized. So you still have effectively spinless time reversal symmetry. That's the main point that I want to make. Okay. So, okay, so let me close. How much time do I have? Can I talk for a few more minutes? Yeah, um, there's still half an hour of discussion. Oh, okay, then I'm going to finish That's early. Maybe we can have some discussion and that might be fun. Yeah, okay, good. So let me, let me, let me, let me spend 10 minutes or so um, talking about uh, mechanisms um, and possible mechanisms of what we know about them. So um, I think that uh, one issue, you know, one issue about, you know, okay, there, there are three obvious choices, right? Like, or at least, I don't know if they're even obvious, but there are certainly three choices that I was able to come up with and not really distinguish between um, at this stage, right? Uh, there are constraints, you know, one of them is, okay, these are all superconductors that are happening right next to ferromagnetic phase transitions. Um, so an obvious, an obvious question is, is it fluctuations? Is it fluctuation mediated? That would be nice, right? Um, could it be phonons, right? Sure, yeah, I think I'll, I'll talk about how that might come about and, and maybe how we can tell. Um, and finally, there are actually some kind of interesting proposals in the literature that are vaguely reminiscent of the situation that we're in with annular Fermi surfaces, which may make cone luttinger type mechanisms more plausible than, um, than they usually are in terms of giving you some sort of reasonable, uh, reasonable coupling. Okay, and then I'll try to talk about how we tell and you know what, what's next to do. So, okay, question on how, how it can be fluctuations, right? I mean, of course, the, the I talked about two of the three superconductors. The third one is also occurring at the boundary of a ferromagnetic phase transition. The fermiology there is hard to understand, and we haven't really processed it yet, but it's it's not that different from the other superconductors, but it's not exactly the same. We're not sure exactly how. It may just be that we can't measure it well. But the bottom line is that all three superconductors seem to show up right at the cusp of ferromagnetic phase transition. So, okay, fluctuations, obviously a, a good choice. One issue, right, is that the transitions in the fermiology are rather sudden. So, you know, the superconductor one is occurring in this annular Fermi C, but then almost immediately afterwards, as a function of density, you know, the superconductor dies, and then there's a totally different Fermi surface. So the transition looks rather first order, and so you'd say maybe fluctuations are not that important. Now, you know, countervailing fact is that the transitions where superconductivity is observed are not nearly as first order as others. You know, so in in you know I showed you this uh, experiment as a function of density of of displace of the gate voltages in a different regime where you actually have hysteresis. This is clearly a very first order experiment. This phase knows nothing about this other phase, even when it's metastable. Um, but you know, we certainly have not seen any hysteresis across the transitions where um, where superconductivity is observed. It may be that it's weakly first order or it's a second order transition where the order parameter just grows really fit, really quickly as a function of density. I can't exclude it. I think it's an interesting topic for future work, but that's 
in so much as there's a problem with fluctuations, it's that based on just fermiology, uh, this SC1, for example, just looks very, it looks rather first order. It looks like you have one Fermi surface that superconducts, and then there's a first order transition to a different Fermi surface that doesn't superconduct. And that doesn't seem so consistent with fluctuations. Um, additional uh, constraints on thinking about fluctuations are actually that studying this in detail, it turns out that that partially isospin polarized phase is, a, is an intricate animal. Um, in particular, what I'm showing you here is a measurement. This is SC1, and I'm showing you in-plane field dependence of the, here's the annular. This is the annular uh, Fermi C, and then the proximal phase apparently is not a spin polarized, um, iso, you know, PIP phase. There's a spin polarized PIP phase that uh, is favored by the in-plane magnetic field, but that's not the state proximal to superconductivity. And so I have no idea what the spin unpolarized, partially isospin polarized phase is. Presumably it's something maybe with valley coherence or some other type of valley order. But um, you know, if you're trying to come up with a theory of uh, of fluctuation mediated superconductivity in this um, in this superconductor, it you know it's got to account for that. It's apparently not just a spin ferromagnet next door. Um, it's something. Uh, it's something else, which is uh, has a much smaller um, in-plane magnetic moment than a spin ferromagnet. Okay. So anyway, just uh, we have a question here from Priya Sharma again, um, who asks, "How does the magnitude of the BCS gap you can derive compare to the gap you can tune using the displacement field?" Sorry, say that one more time. How does the magnitude of the BCS gap you can derive compare to the gap you can tune using the displacement field? Which gap can I tune using the displacement field? Which gap are you referring to? You're referring to the gap at charge neutrality? The, the gap between the dense steel uh, at the Fermi level, isn't it? But there's no, oh, I mean, there's just, there's no, it's all metals, right? I mean, there's a gap at charge neutrality, which is probably tens of milli electron volts. And then there's a superconducting gap, which is a fraction of a Kelvin. So, um, you know, there, there are no energy gaps except for the superconducting gap or a charge neutrality, which is very far away. So, I mean, the, the, the spacing between the bands is pretty big uh, at these displacement fields compared to superconducting gaps. Okay, thanks. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, all right. So anyway, so, so these are some constraints on fluctuation mediated things. I think this is an interesting question for theory. I hope that this will catalyze some thought about it. Um, let's talk about phonons, right? So the main issue is, you know, this coincidence, like why does superconductivity occur at a symmetry breaking transition if they have totally different origins, right? It's not obvious, but um, but maybe it is obvious, you know, the stoner criterion and the and BCS superconductivity are just different mechanisms but they both rely on high density of states, right? So one could imagine, you know, a case where, you know, there's a critical density of states for, for um, ferromagnetism, which depends on Coulomb repulsions. And then there's a critical density of states for superconductivity that depends on electron phonon attraction. And so, you know, there are two scenarios, either one is bigger than the other or the other is bigger than the one. And so let's say you have this density of states for ferromagnetism is smaller than the critical density of states for superconductivity. Basically, the picture I want to draw is oversimplified, but let's say we have two, um, you know, we imagine what the density of states as a function of density looks like for a full metal and a half metal. Then as you go to lower density, you will approach uh, this critical density for ferromagnetism, at which point you will ferromagnetically polarize right? You'll never be, get to rose superconductivity, and then you'll just rise again uh, along the half metal, and again, then you'll probably polarize to the quarter metal, and you just never get to high enough density of states to, to superconduct. You, know, you never see the naked Van Hove singularity. Ferromagnetism happens first, okay? The other alternative, right, is that the ferromagnetic critical, you know, let's say repulsion is weak, then ferromagnetic critical uh, density of states is, is larger, which means that you first hit rho superconductivity. Now you start seeing superconductivity, right? But the dent, that's a small, you know, it's a small gap because maybe electron phonon coupling is, 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 is relatively weak and the TC is small, but it gets getting bigger. But then you hit rho ferromagnetism and now you become ferromagnetic again and superconductivity is destroyed. 
And that would produce exactly the sort of phase diagram that we see in that we have, um, you know, we have superconductivity on the boundary of a ferromagnetic transition, even though they have nothing to do with each other, right? And if that transition is strongly first order, the superconductor wouldn't know anything about the ferromagnetism. So there's a question from PRC here. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, because the boundary is the end. Can't hear, can't hear, can't hear. All right, okay, so the question is, how does the bandwidth compare with the Debye energy? Uh, the Debye energy is way bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's, it's not moved while the room is going to be a phone-based system. You better repeat it, Sam, because I can't hear peers at all. Yeah. Yeah, so with Debye energy much bigger than the bandwidth, usually, I mean, the naive, a thing is that rules out phonon mediated superconductivity that usually only happens in the other limit. I guess that, you know, so I, from my reading of the literature, th that's not, I mean, a, a strontium titanate, I thought, was, you know, is in that limit and that superconducts and that's electron phonon. Uh, um, turn off your thing. Wait, what, Just turn off your, turn off your, your speaker. speaker. Yeah, it might be better yeah. to talk directly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, let me go back a second, but, you know, Hang on. I should have had the reference, right? But my, you know, my understanding from the, there's a paper by Gorkov from just a few years ago, um, oh, yeah. the right? Yeah. That uh, the basic yeah. argument is that, you know, once you, you know, when you study that anti-adiabatic limit, you can still get BCS instability and it's just omega Debye is replaced by T Fermi. That's sort of how, that's that's what I understood from that paper is that it's not impossible. It's just that the scale is no longer omega Debye, yeah, it's, it's T Fermi. Andrea, yeah. I don't think it's fair to compare with strontium titanate where you have this extraordinary polarizability that basically crushes RS down mm -hmm. to small values. Um, uh, there's no polarizability here. The Coulomb interaction is still quite strong. So, so I, I'm not actually so sure about that. Uh, I, and the reason, you know, the, you know, the, I don't know because the, you know, all this density of states at the Fermi surface is also screening a lot. And for example, when we try to look at hartree fock you know, it's just totally wrong, right? These annuli, for example, which are ubiquitous in experiment are destroyed by like kind of weakish correlations in theory. And they're not an experiment. So I'm not so sure that actually the correlations are so strong. I, I don't, I, anyway, I just want to point that out because I don't okay. know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, can I also ask a quick question here? Sure. That you've compared these two scenarios. However, this should depend on temperature, shouldn't it? Because rho FM to the leading order in the stoner um, uh, criteria is temperature independent, whereas rho SC is temperature dependent. So at low enough temperature, rho SC will always win. Um, or are there higher yes, order? No, that's, exactly, that's absolutely right, right? So a rho SC will win as long as you uh, um, you are not already having stonered at higher temperature, right? In other words, you know that if you are beyond rho FM, then you're now in this, you know, now have rather low density of state. So yeah, sure, if you get to really, really low temperatures, but you're no longer close to where maybe that was relevant. So, yeah, right. But so think, it's, what's yeah. true, and, and I totally agree, I think if I'm taking your question correctly, is that away farther away from this transition if i went to lower temperatures i should get more superconductivity yeah and yeah I, I would love to do that we're trying to you know we're already as cold as we can go right now so great question right um it's a very good question right uh i want to point out one thing that's wrong with the phonon thing so far right which is that um from what we know about uh band, uh, what we know about the band structure and the density of states, right? If we look at the change, this is a temperature dependence of the superconductor, right? Um, as a function of density, TC goes from being observable to basically not being observable, you know, over a pretty narrow range of density. Okay. And in our density of states, you know, that's not, it doesn't act, we don't think that corresponds to a huge change in density of states to the point where, you know, if I think about the sort of normalized change in 
TC and compare it to what that would imply for the normalized change in the dimensionless coupling, it's, it doesn't quite quantitatively match. Now, this is super crude, right? I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this could easily be wrong, but I just want to point out that, you know, essentially, I think this is another way of saying the same thing that uh, you just said, Sam, which is that, um, you know, superconductivity should win at low temperatures, right? And basically what we find is that it doesn't win, you know, it wins at low temperatures only closer to the transition than one might naively have estimated, right? That, that if I go all the way back to my phase diagram um, here, it's, you know, it's a question of, is this a narrow or a broad range of superconductivity? And you need to have some, you know, what does the notion of, of narrowness or broadness mean here? And I think, it, you know, you have to compare to what you think the density of single particle density of states is doing. And I would say that it seems to be rather narrow. That's, that's the basic, that's the basic takeaway is that it's more narrow than one might naively expect by a factor of a couple, right? Uh, it's not an enormous factor, but it's enough of a factor to give me some pause about saying it's phonons, let's move on with our lives, right? Um, uh, and yeah. Can I just put a comment in here then that this also is very much dependent on um, more precise details and corrections to those formulas you've shown. Absolutely. Because as Piers mentioned, that formula is only valid when the Debye energy is much smaller than the bandwidth, which is not true in this situation. Yeah. And certainly there will be strong corrections to these formulas, which would, which could explain it. Totally. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Look at so, deep um, yeah. I mean, I, I want to be very clear that, right, I'm going to try to present, you know, my my sort of some speculative thinking on different ideas of what could be going on here. Certainly, you know, there's some work to do right? <laughs> that uh, I do not know the answer. Um, Can I just also say we're now um, well into the discussion phase. So just to allow some more discussion time. We know there's already been a lot, but maybe. Sure. Yeah, time. I'm, I'm basically done. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the basic. Uh, so, you know, one last thing I'll say, right, is that there is a somewhat of an anomaly in high temperature transport um, in that, you know, if we say, look, whatever the whatever the mechanism of uh, let's say that it's either, you know, fluctuations or it's phonons. Presumably those neutral modes that are binding the electrons at low temperatures should also scatter them at high temperatures. We see no evidence of that. There's very little high temperature resistivity at all. Um, so, you know, here's data up to 20 Kelvin and uh, above the superconductor, the resistivity just doesn't do anything. Um, and you might expect from, you know, estimates of that, uh, coupling constant, uh, you know, from this kind of Gorkov, you know, formula, um, something like 10 ohms per Kelvin, but we certainly don't see 10 ohms per Kelvin. Uh, we see, you know, 0.1 ohms per Kelvin or less. So, okay, maybe, maybe it's not anything like this. Maybe it's really just a Fermi surface effect. There's an interesting set of papers, you know, from Steve Kivelson and collaborators um, uh, pointing out that these annular Fermi surfaces might actually be kind of helpful. It was in a different context. It was not for electrons and holes. It was for electrons and electrons. It was imagined for semiconductors, but, you know, might give some sort of reasonable, um, uh, reasonable TC, uh, despite the fact that cone lottinger superconductors are usually kind of only for theorists uh, and not really experimentally uh, relevant. I think that's an interesting question to, to, to think about, but, um, okay. So, uh, let me just conclude by saying there's a couple of nice experiments that I think, you know, basically this is an interesting system because the, this phase diagram is not all that complicated, right? And it's very tunable. Uh, it's much easier to reproduce. Certainly the magnetic phase diagram so far has been trivial to reproduce, just samples all look the same than these twisted systems. I would, you know, I'd like to speculate that the mechanism is similar. There are a lot of things in common. Um, of course, it's possible that everything is totally different, but I, I sort of suspect that's not going to be the case. Um, I think there's an interesting experiment we can do, which is to just put a layer of metal very close to screen interactions on, let's say, the two or three nanometer scale, which is actually considerably smaller than the inter-electron spacing uh, at the densities where all of this happens. And I think there it should answer the question because either that should that should certainly reduce the domain of ferromagnetism and the, the, the regions that are now not ferromagnetic will either be superconducting or the superconductivity will follow the transition. Uh, and I think that should hopefully be kind of dispositive. 
Um, but there are lots of other things that I think we can look at, try to understand that proximal phase, um, and uh, and in particular look at at more generally uh, in the vicinity of these types of transitions, see if we can understand that in, in multi-layer graphites and other systems that are really crystal crystalline um, and uh, and not um, uh, not not don't have the same problems with this order. Um, and you know the final sort of outlook I think is that. Look, you know, there is something rather amazing about this type of sample, which is that, you know, this is a small range of densities and voltages. And, you know, you can make it a metal, an insulator, a superconductor, a ferromagnet. Um, there's a theory idea that, you know, by encapsulating it in semiconductors, uh, you can make it into a quantum spin hall. Certainly, we know by putting a moiré on, you can make it into a quantum anomalous hall. But but even without that, you already have, you know, just a huge swath of physics, which is all gate tunable. And therefore, you can make interfaces between all of these things. I think there's rather interesting stuff to do with, you know, on top of that, ballistic electrons throughout. So um, so I, I'm relatively excited about this this research direction and, and certainly hope some of you will will join me in thinking about it. So, um, okay, let me thank uh, you for your attention. I'm happy to have more discussion. And let me acknowledge again, especially Haoshen, who uh, uh, really was a hero in doing these very difficult experiments uh, and getting them to work, so. Okay, so let's thank Andrea. This now seems to be a relatively second order transition into the discussion time. So um, somebody has a, I uh, know that's a clapping, not a hand up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it's very difficult to distinguish these. Andrew, Andrew Huxley has a question. Yeah, thank you for a, a very nice talk. Um, could you uh, just mention why you only get the superconductivity in the whole dope side, if that's if I've understood that bit correctly? So uh, the short answer is. Um, we don't really know. The long answer is uh, you didn't quite understand it correctly because there is a superconductor on the electron dope side also. Oh, that tiny pocket, yeah. This tiny little pocket. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, these transitions are much more first order. So it's possible. And But also there are no annuli. You know, so so yeah, I, there, there are a lot of things that correlate that I don't know, but so many things correlate that I don't know which one is important. So I can say that, you know, for the electron side at high density, the transitions are more first order. There are also no annular Fermi surfaces. And okay, those are two facts. And and as in, in contrast on the whole side, there are, and there are also no isos, partially isospin polarized phases on the electron side. So almost none of the features that seem to be associated with superconductivity are present on the electron side, except for down at low density, low displacement field, where actually the fermiology is more similar to the fermiology here. So some combination of those factors is important. I'm not sure which one is essential or if they're all essential, but um, you know, you need. It seems like you need annuli. It seems like you need partially isospin polarized phases, and it seems like you don't want the transitions to be super first order. Yeah, thank thank you. I, I know you gave a reference to why annular superconductor. Sorry, annular. Band structure was important. Can you is, do you have a physical insight as to why that is, other than the density of states argument? No, I, I, from yeah. So I mean, the, the, I don't know whether the annual is important. For there's a specific. I'm I'm more or less going just by pattern recognition of, of pictures, mm -hmm. but there's a uh, the paper by Kibbelson and, and collaborators. And there's a couple of them was pointing out that you know in in multi subband semiconductor systems where you might have a, a large Fermi surface and a small one. There's some interplay where if the small one is kind of the right size, then a cone luttinger type mechanism can mediate uh, mediate pairing kind of on the bigger one. That was the rough, that was my rough takeaway. But you know, I mean, don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm far from an expert. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So the small one could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be somehow related to the large one. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. I think that 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 you know, it's kind of a low temperature limit thing where the Fermi surfaces are, are quite sharp. So I think they kind of don't know about each other, whether they're electron, electron or electron and hole. And then, yeah, I don't the how the details there work out. I have no idea. Yeah. Just, just while I've still got the microphone sure, uh, sure. on your on your figure that you've got there, you've, you've also got some light blue regions close to um, the zero doping. Um, oh, you mean just like these broad swaths here? No, no, at high D, uh, close oh, to the Oh, that's just, that's just like, uh, it's there it's actually totally insulating and it's kind of just overloading of instrumentation. That's just, a, that's okay. not a real effect. Right. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Sure, sure.
two ways to get a zero, right? Any other questions? You always have a question, Piers. <laughs> yeah, Piers, what do you think? <laughs> Okay, let me ask you about the welcome up. Right. I can put this up. Yeah, so uh, maybe some questions about your fully polarized states, which have, um, which um, occur, but still have valley, which still have valley um, symmetry there. Um, so I guess your thoughts are there that you can have a state that's spin symmetric, um, but valley anti-symmetric in that context. Uh, I think that's right, yeah. Um, You're and, talking about a superconductor. Right. Yeah, that, but, that's a possibility. I mean, there are, of course, other possibilities. It's just... Uh, now, yeah, Valley. So, of course, similar things have been thought about in superconductors in the context of, of having them be orbitally anti-symmetric. Um, and I guess there's a sort of analogy. Here. I think that's quite analogous. Yeah, that sounds quite analogous. Um, uh, is there any? What, what are what are some what are examples actually? I mean, the, well, no, there's nothing confirmed, but but there have been discussions of this in the context of ion-based superconductors, for example. Um, mm. The possibility that Wundt's coupling could drive a state that is, uh, which is uh, spin triplet, but but. Uh, Orbitally anti-symmetric has been something discussed, for example, by 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 Andrei Chubikov and by our group also. Um, so um, uh, I'm just wondering whether any connections can be made can be made there. But uh, Bali so, yeah. is not connected with anything real space, though, is it? It's a different location. Oh, it is. It's just a kind of uh, yeah. It it is. It, it's some you know difference in wave functions on the scale of the graphene lattice, which is smaller than the Fermi wavelength, obviously, but it's certainly a real space. I see. So we could kind of make an analogy between... I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I would. the valleys are orbitals. They're certainly orbitals. They're just, you know, th there's a nice separation of scales between yep. Fermi wavelength and the lattice scale, well, which well, lets you is, kind of is... think about them as a spin. But actually, in this context, they're not. The wave functions really are different in between the two valleys. Yeah, we can't we can't think of them as orbitals associated. Yeah, what, what am I trying to say here? Um, okay, so yeah, no, I don't know whether this is relevant or not. But there is there there are some thoughts that if you have an uh, a superconducting state that is orbitally anti-symmetric um, uh, and spin triplet, um, that that in order to have a Cooper instability, uh, a, a, you have to have very special conditions uh, satisfied because uh, when you delocalize a state that's orbitally anti-symmetric, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily become a state that's odd parity in, space, in momentum space. And uh, um, presumably when you're on the Fermi surface, the notion of valley is not R, but maybe it is. Is the notion of a valley well defined on the Fermi surface here, or does it get lost? Should be, unless there's um, intervalley that, coherence or something like that. Yeah, so that's different with orbital degrees of freedom because orbital degrees of freedom get lost typically on a Fermi surface, and so in that sense, it's different. So my guess is, would is be, there a length scale reason where you know the orbitals are are different on a sufficiently no, simply because when you hop from one site to another, you don't preserve the orbital ah, quantum. Right. Yeah. So, so typically in 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 graphene, because the valleys are very well separated, that that's a pretty good approximate approximately that's right. conserved that's quantity, different. unless you have some right. spontaneous symmetry breaking. Right. And so, since you've got a well-defined valley quantum number on the Fermi surface, that's very different then to orbital uh, to an orbitally anti-symmetric uh, state. In mm. fact, so. Yeah. So in some sense, you can, in fact, use the uh, orbital quantum number like a spin quantum number. Uh, and so as you were kind of implying, maybe it's much more like an S-wave superconductor in that context. Yeah. yeah I mean, 
yeah so it would be it would be spatially symmetric still it wouldn't be spatially anti-symmetric um it would be an even parity uh pair that would, would be forming in that context um, that's right yeah yeah okay yeah uh do you have any situations where you think it might be a triplet tri triplet pairing uh without using this without using the valley degree of freedom no um you know i certainly not uh <laughs> i okay. i don't know yeah I, I you know these this is what we see so far um you know my basic attitude towards all of this superconductivity in you know moire and 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 now this system is to try and find the simplest possible thing and the least mo and then see if we can kill that with experiment um mm -hmm. so far i would say that here you know that seems like the null hypothesis to to attack um mm -hmm. and you know i don't know sc2 of course could be something more exotic that just seems like a, a plausible hypothesis that doesn't require anything you know any any pyrotechnics um yep. and you know okay let's see there should be some prediction that 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 that, that will distinguish it from something more exotic okay yeah very good so Gunnar has a question as well yeah just to follow up a bit on the discussion of the valid degree of freedom so uh, it seems like you have a very clear hierarchy that um you know you tend to split uh the spin but you you don't split the valley right so um uh, is there any situation in the in this um, bilayer trilayer systems where you could actually induce some valley polarization or, or is it basically impossible because uh, it's maybe unfavorable energetically to, to localize particles on one sublattice in the end of the day well i mean certainly when you have the you know eventually you valley and spin polarize just when you need to choose one flavor that is seems to be what it does so that right. that that it, it doesn't seem totally unfavorable in the sense that at least valley polarization is uh into one valley seems to be favored over intervalley coherence at least for a quarter metal where you just have one flavor um the whether you can have like a valley polarized you know two-fold state we haven't seen it but you know the, the the bottom like the the main message that i would say is that um almost everything is pretty subtle these energy differences are not huge for most of these things so um you know for example efforts to find this or that within hartree fock mostly have just failed to match experiment i don't know you know that just doesn't seem to capture the screening correctly we've not been able to get any you know so so and and the energy diff you know but if you just look at hartree fock results the energy differences between this or that state are tiny of all these different things they're very small um so it would you know there are some things i didn't talk about but like in random places within the space time, there's clearly some additional phase boundaries between you know one type of quarter metal and a different type of quarter metal we don't really know what those are we don't really know what distinguishes them maybe the anomalous hull will change but will be finite in both or they'll do this or that so i think there's you know there's probably a lot more subtlety of which phases are where than what we've been able to figure out so far and sometimes it's hard to even tell but i think all of these energy scales are quite close together that is definitely true um so i don't know if, if that gives you license it's a good takeaway point think, yeah, yeah. Then, but, then, I mean, then please take it as way, license to think yeah. yeah it feeds some proper numerical investigations right or it calls yeah. for yeah. Yeah. proper yeah. numerical investigations to really get precision answers beyond I, you know so so my dream and i don't know if this is just an unrealistic dream is that this is a very simple system. It's six atoms in the unit cell. Like, yeah. it's pretty mm -hmm. simple compared to twisted bilayer, but lots of similar tunability, if anything more, because displacement field really has a big effect. You're completely changing things. Lots of experiments we can do. Um, now, I know that, you know, numerical simulations of, you know, metals and superconductors is kind of hard, right? So, but the question is, like, is it, you know, I don't know, is there somewhere for you know these experiments can you know this is the first experiment it can get quite precise you know you want to know numbers you we know the electrostatics we know the single particle structure really well there's essentially no disorder i don't know what i can give theorists more than that right i mean that's a lot of so the question is like what's the right numerical technique to try and like see can we really understand this sort of down to the bottom i mean in in for as an example right in graphene quantum hall 
systems, what we've been able to do, um, which is an experiment I'm very proud of, even though it's not you know, widely known, is to you know, measure the total energy of electrons at partial filling of a Landau level, right? And you can see that, you can do that very precisely, and then you can compare it to DMRG and really get a quantitative match down to you know, experimental uncertainties and things like the dielectric constant of boron nitrate, but you can account for screening, you can account for all of the details, and then it actually works, and you actually get a quantitative answer, and you can have some confidence that you know, it's not like, oh, we're off by a factor of three, but that's probably disorder, and everybody waves, you know, waves their hands and moves on, but no, we actually got the right answer. It actually works out fine, and when it doesn't work, you sort of know why. I wonder if that's possible to do here. That would at least be, that would be a very satisfying direction to try and pursue and see if we can make a better connection there, because we do have the experimental control, we don't have the disorder, and it's a simple enough system, but okay, you know, the same problems are, are there that are there for every other metal. And you have it on substrate, right? So there's no effects of warping or anything. Nope, yeah, and, and we understand those substrate effects pretty well, and there's some stuff that we can change, and, and so. Okay, well, sounds like a plan at some stage. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I have one last question, hopefully relatively quick. It's just um, a thought that usually if you have something like fluctuation induced superconductivity, the signatures of that are not in the superconducting phase, they're in the metal phase around it. So how carefully did you explore the metal phase close to superconductivity? I mean, you're, you know, so here's quantum oscillations yeah, yeah. and, you know, above the superconductor, it doesn't look very different than it does farther yeah. away, but. So it really does just seem to be single particle physics with whatever stoner feels. That, I, you know, that that's okay. You know, let me try to dig and find, you know, interesting fact is that, you know, the, harmonics of quantum oscillations okay which okay is a, some, a, a, an experimental detail but it is intriguing that some of these harmonics seem to disappear right around where the ground state is a superconductor um is that meaningful i don't know does that mean there's more scattering in the normal state uh that is you know sort of killing your phase coherence length or something um above the superconductor, maybe, I'm not sure, that's just a wild speculation, but that's that's one thing that we noticed that is different about the normal state above the superconductor versus say far away, where that, you know, where, where these types of, this is, you know, two orbits of the Fermi surface, right? Um, of the small Fermi surface, and it seems to be gone very close, but, you know, okay, we don't understand every detail of these, so maybe that's making much ado about nothing, um, but, okay. It's a bit of information you can take. Uh, something for us theorists to consider, I think. Something to think about, yeah, something to think about. Okay, well, I think we've now run out of time. So um, let's all thank Andrea again for a fantastic talk. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you in person sometime soon. And Maybe this concludes <laughs> the Physics um, 2020. Condensed matter, uh, condensed matter physics in the city um, 2021. So, for some closing remarks, um, do you want to say oh, something? Okay. Not to say, but, um, uh, yeah, well, just come. I think just for the record, uh, we want to thank all the people who have attended uh, condensed matter physics in the city uh, and also all the speakers who generously provided their time and also allowed their work to be recorded and put online. That we really appreciate that. And of course, we're hoping that we tried this year, as you can see, we're only a few people actually in person this year, but we're hoping that next year we'll have a whole group of people sitting together, close up, uh, doing it face to face. But we'll also try to continue the hybrid mode that has been so successful this year as well. So thank you, everyone. And, and uh, thank you again, Andrea, for coming uh, so early in the morning for your time. Yeah. Good. And see you all next year. Thank you.